Okay, we're recording on this one. So I think I'll, we'll try, I'll try and start. This Veterans History Project interview is being conducted on Thursday, November, on Thursday, uh, June the 19th, uh, in the year 2014 here at the Niles Public Library. Uh, my name is Neil O'Shea. I'm a member of the reference staff, and I'm privileged to be speaking with Mr. Harold Henry uh, Horseman. Uh, Mr. Horseman was born on November the 30th, 1917, in Nebraska, uh, and now lives in Morton Grove. Uh, he has kindly consented to be interviewed for this project, and here is his story of service during World War II. Uh, Mr. Horseman, do you recall when you entered the service? 1936. 1936? In the cavalry. In the cavalry. So they had horses still then? Yes, they still had horses, and I rode the same horse for two years. I'm just curious, what was the horse's name? Did Jupiter. You? Jupiter. Good horse? Good horse. Yeah. Yeah. And um, so you had, you had chosen to en enlist in the, uh, in the Army on your own then? You yes. Were, yeah. yeah. So you were already serving in the Army when the so fun started? I, I got discharged just before the war broke out. Then I re-enlisted again. And did you have the opportunity to get back into the... Cavalry there was no cavalry. There was no cavalry. There was no cavalry. No. Many, many, uh, mechanical one. Yeah. So at that time, were you still living in, in Nebraska? No, in South Dakota. Fort Meade, South Dakota. Troop and F of the 4th Cavalry. Troop F of the 4th Cavalry. And um, did you have an occupation at that time? Like when you came out of the, from your first service, did you... Did you have a chance to get a, a job or a secure employment somewhere? No. And then, um, and so when you when you um, enlisted, that was in South Dakota. No, in Nebraska. Back in Nebraska. And did did you choose the service? Did you choose the army? Yes. Yeah. So that was what you wanted to do. Yes. And then you were inducted in uh, Omaha or. So that's where I finally went to Omaha to get sworn in. Sworn in. And uh, did you find that the Army had changed much to while you were from a peacetime outfit to a wartime outfit? Yes, quite a bit. Yeah. Quite a bit. Yeah. So even though you already had been in the Army, did you still have to go to through um, uh, basic training? No, no. In fact, I was a private... We went to Fort Sheridan. I was training. I was a private, and I was still doing instructions. So, from Nebraska, then you wind up at Fort Sheridan. And when, when I enlisted, they told me I could with, have three choices. I could have everything I want. I just said, well, why do I have to give you three choices? <laughs> well, they sent me to Fort Sheridan, which I didn't want, and I was in a Kentucky National Guard unit which I didn't want. So was that interesting, working with the, the gentleman from Kentucky? Was it a change of pace? It was. It finally turned out they were, they were all right. It, uh, and then after after Fort Sheridan, did you have to go for training anywhere else? Or? Well, we went. I went overseas. We went overseas in 42. 42? Mm -hmm. So is that North Africa? or? No, we went into... Uh, England first. See, we didn't, we didn't go to North Africa in November, mm -hmm. and I went over in April of 42. So from April to November, we were more or less doing the training all the time. Was it a dangerous crossing, uh, going over in the troop ship at that time? Yeah, the U-boats are out looking for us. I went over on the Aquitania, which was at that time was the fourth largest ship. Did but you get seasick? No. Not that time. So the when you were in England doing the training, did um, did it seem the time passed slowly? No, actually, it kind of went fast. It's, uh, Do you recall where you were in uh, in stationed in England at that time? Yeah, we were at uh, Stormont Palace, which 
was a prime. We were in Northern Ireland. That was the Prime Minister of Northern Ireland's estate. Oh, Stormont Castle or something. Yeah. And that's where I learned to play golf. They have good golf courses up there. Yeah, well, we could get a pass to go to the golf course. But we couldn't get a pass to go into Belfast. So we went over to the golf course, and those old gentlemen let us have their clubs. And that wasn't the ro that wasn't the Royal Down Golf Club or something. No, no, no. no. Huh? no. I just feel like I want to interject here. My mother's from Northern Ireland, so I I know the area a little bit. She was in London while you were there. A beautiful golf course. Yeah. They didn't use lawnmowers to keep it the grass. Now they use sheep. Yeah. And so you enjoyed your time in the in 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 Ireland, the North. Yeah. Yeah. So we were there from April to 40 uh, November when we went in North Africa. And at this time, was this? Do you recall what unit you were in now? This was the. Hundred uh, third. Anti-aircraft battalion, special weapons. And don't ask me how I remember it. <laughs> yeah, just made I'm sure made an impression. And then um, special weapons did that that suggested you receive training in some of some of these. Well, I had uh, and after I we got through training in Ireland, I had a unit, 20 man unit with a half track with 40 millimeter bofer and a half track with quadruple 50 caliber machine guns and then a single machine gun. So we operated a unit of 20 men. So then from uh, from Northern Ireland, do you go to into England then? And, and then no, we went to Sicily. Oh, you're in the invasion of Sicily. Yeah. Wow. That was the first I don't know how long after the D-Day went into Africa, but Sicily we went in H hour plus 20 minutes. We were 20 minutes after the first wave. So were you under the leadership of General Patton in that? I was sometimes, which I didn't like. I didn't like him. Why? Well, one reason is when he slapped that man. Oh, you heard all about that, I suppose. Yeah. yeah. And then when we were in Sicily, after the campaign was over, I was walking out to my gun, carrying my leggings in my hand. The car stopped on the road, his patent stopped me, fined me for being out of uniform. And we had to do closer order drill. He was something else. At that time, what would a fine be? That would be a deduction from your army pay? Yeah, 15 bucks. That was a lot of money. If there were three men in the cab of a truck, he gave them a fine. So $15, that might be what you would make in a week or something? Or? Yeah, well, if, uh, the sergeant would make $54 a month. <laughs> so you were a sergeant at this time? So you were promoted to sergeant when you were in, in Northern Ireland or in England? Or? No, and we, 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 we took the uh, train from, when we left Fort Sheridan, we went to Indian Town Gap, Pennsylvania, and the train in New York, then they made me sergeant, private for sergeant. Um, Mr. Horseman, you're wearing a bronze star cap today. Where did you receive your bronze star? In Germany. So you complete the the Allies take it Sicily, and then from Sicily do you sail to France or do you go up through Italy? Or we went back to France to reorganize. And on uh, D-Day, I was four days after D-Day. I went in four days later. So you came in through Normandy. Yes. But four days after the first wave. That's still pretty quick. But it was. Still something. Yeah. So you're probably going through those hedgerows with that yes. mobile mechanized vehicles. And you talk to hedgerows, and some of the people here think it's a bunch of group of hedges, but some of those hedgerows are 20 feet across where they kept building dirt or building up. Um, I interviewed. Uh, veteran. He came in, I think, after you did. 
but he went through France and he didn't think the French people were that nice. I, I thought they were nice. The you were good in France, yeah. The best people that I was treated was a Belgian. But the French treated us nice, they treated us anyway. Yeah. Um, pardon me for a stupid question, perhaps. Were, were there many times when you were really frightened, afraid? Yeah, I guess you all do. You all know you could That's be up. They're human. Yeah. So when you're progressing across uh, northern France through Belgium, so then you, were you involved in the Bulge then, maybe, or in the Ardennes, or not? Mm -hmm. Were you involved in the Battle of the Bulge or the no. Ardennes Forest? No? no, I got out before then. I was wounded November 11th, 1943, uh, just before the Battle of the Bulge. So I missed that. Where were you wounded? In, in France. In France. Was it a bubble? No, in Germany, rather. Was it a bullet or no, concussion. No, concussion? Concussion. And so then were you sent to the military field hospital or well, back I went to the Paris? Field hospital. I went to a hospital in Paris that we had taken over. It was a maternity hospital that the government had taken over. And I went to one uh, La Haye du Puy, France, that's on the French Peninsula, and then to England, then Long Island, and Long Island went to Texas. I was in the hospital almost eight months. Wow. Eight months to recover from that uh, severe head trauma or whatever. The concussion that was caused by a by an exploding by a bomb by a shell. shell. Yeah. We were having heavy shelling, and I was going out the gun, and that's the last I remember. Was it in '88? Yeah. In '88, yeah. To me, that was the best gun in the war. The German '88. They could use that for any aircraft, for any tank, infantry. They use it for everything. All they do is change a shell. So, um, so you came out of the service then in '45, or yes, uh -huh. and then were you released in in Chicago, or right? No, I was released in San Antonio, Texas. San Antonio. They probably gave you a, a railway pass or something, or fare to get back somewhere. No, they gave me. I don't forget what it is. Now they give you travel money to get back home. Yeah. Did you, um, were you able to stay in touch with some of your buddies from the Army, or? We did uh, pretty close touch. We had three unions. The last one was 1970. And the man that was responsible for the reunions passed away, and mm. nobody took over. So 1970 was our last reunion. Okay. So we had one here in Chicago, one in Pittsburgh, and one in uh, New York. And this was the 103rd anti-aircraft. Right. Special weapons. Yeah. Pardon me for hopping around. Um, do you recall where in Germany you were injured? Yeah, just just before we got to Cologne. Before you got to Cologne. Between Aachen and Cologne. Aachen and Cologne. The um, when you came out of the army, then um, did you? Have was it hard for you to, to get a job, to get employment? Well, I didn't try it right away. I, of course not, yeah. I was getting 60% disability, so... So, um, you always remember World War II every day. Yeah. One thing that I remember you talk about Germany, we were in Aachen, before we took Aachen, they were dive-bombing our planes, dive-bombing Aachen. But they drop the bomb, you would see the bombs go right over our head. We were that close to Aachen. Mm. Were there any other particular um, incidents or experiences that stand out in your mind? Any situations with a kind of funny or something or unusual or that you wouldn't expect? Well, you know, it's, I don't remember them, but it's when we had the reunion, that's what always come up was the funny incidents. Yeah. 
forget about the other ones. Yeah. You might remember somebody was killed or something like that. Yeah. So, um, you saw a lot of combat. Yes. Yeah. Is there any general description or co you could make about being in combat that people might not realize or understand? It's hell. Yeah. It's, but you do what you have to, and that's the way it goes. Yeah. I had one that tell me that it's just chaos, completely chaos. There's no... Yeah. yeah. The one time when we were in Sicily, we were at a ridge just beyond the, the beach, and we had our gun in position there. One day, looking out, and we could see the, uh, the planes of Gila. There's only two planes in Sicily, Medina and, and Gila. We were at Chile, and all our troops we could see them were coming back. And it was so funny, I don't, we, we had to take our 40 millimeters. We had, usually we had the armor piercing, uh, warrant detonating, and tracers in it. So we had to take everything out but the armor piercing and load our gun with armor piercing, all the shell, which, we couldn't have knocked off of one of those tanks anyway. But it was just funny all at once they started going back again. Were there, um, um, were you impressed by any of your officers? Did you have some good officers? Yeah, I had some real good ones, and I had some, had some lousy ones too. Mm -hmm. I think the best officer I had was on the cavalry, because they were all outdoor men, the officers. It was, rode the horses and everything. It was, that was the best officer. Yeah. And go there was officer go to officer candy school and they'd send them over there and they didn't know from Shinola. Mm -hmm. So when you're uh, back home and feeling a little better, then did you, you join some of the uh, veterans associations like that? I've been a member of American Legion for 69 years. I also belong to the VFW. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, and a disabled American veteran. Yeah. And then um, you made an honor flight. I, yes. That must have been a wonderful experience. It was uh, the best day of my life. It made you feel like you really did something. When I got discharged from Texas, I got the bus in the back of Nebraska. That was nothing. It was like you went to the store or something and came back. Yeah. But that trip really, really you realized what you had done. It was. Yeah. It's just amazing the uh, the debt that the United States and the world owes to those uh, to your generation, because you had to fight on two fronts, project American power across all that distance. It's just I don't know what happened. Would have, what the world would be like if it weren't for the for the greatest generation. Um, the other thing, I, it seems to me, is that all these vets had a good high school education, it seems to me. Mm -hmm. It seems to me that the veterans all had a good high school education, most of them. That's what I had, ninth grade. Ninth grade. Well, you had a good nine years of education. Because, I mean, the, um, it seems like the, the American Army went from nothing to these Millions and millions of people the, from all over the country. The sergeants of the American Army made the Army. When I went in, there was 180,000 men in the Army. We got more than that scattered around the world today. It was the sergeants that did the training. So... I trained... A, when I got in, I trained a 52nd Training Battalion, which is uh, Torrey Pond's golf course now, up on the... Well, I'm right out of La, La Jolla. And after 52nd, I went to 50, I organized the 57th. Hell, I didn't do it alone. I helped organize the 57th and train sector service there. But we were trained to select the service, and after the training period, 
We were making the best men corporals. Well, they, they didn't know enough to be corporals, but you, you had to have them to keep building up. I had a captain, Captain, I can't remember his name. He was writing a book, Wandering to Victory. And I wish he'd have finished it. Teddy Poe. He taught school at Norsberg Military Institute. Teddy Poe, P O? P O E, yeah. P O E, oh, like Edgar Allen, yeah. And the military school was? Military, uh, Norsberg Military Academy. I think it was in Kentucky, because he was in Kentucky. The Kentucky, some of the Kentucky men were good fighters, weren't they? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I didn't know, after they, got, they adopted me, I guess, I'll give you a good example. We went to Fort Sheridan on the top floor. They had a 22 rifle range. And if you weren't from Kentucky, I never fired. And from Kentucky, she never got a chance, he called <laughs> So, um, um, I think we might be coming to the end of the, of the interview. Um, and there's always two questions that we ask, uh, that they recommend that we ask the veterans. Um, and, and in your case, you've already an anticipated this a little bit. Um, uh, Mr. Horseman, how do you think your service and military experiences affected your life? I don't know. It's just, I think you learn a lot. It sure as heck doesn't do anybody any harm to serve. If you're going to be a bad person, you're going to be a bad person whether you're in the service or not. So if you, you can't blame the service for anything. Yeah. And I, I, I enjoyed it. You enjoyed it? Yeah. Well, you must have, because you were in in 36. Well, and if I hadn't got a medical discharge, I'd probably stayed in. Stayed in the Army? No. You might wonder if you'd have wound up in Korea. I don't know. Probably. Yeah. <laughs> or if I'd stayed in, I might even end up in Vietnam. Well. And then, uh, Mr. Horseman, um, do you think your military experience has it influenced your thinking about war? Yes. I think there's a lot of useless fighting going on. And some of these countries where they get their arms are get probably from us and from uh, Russia. And then they use them against us. Uh, Mr. Horseman, is there anything you would like to add that we have not covered in this interview? Well, I think he should tell you why he was bounced from sergeant to private eight times. No, not that major. Oh, pardon me. Um, Mr. Horseman's uh, wife, Betty, is uh, present during this interview, and she's just suggested that uh, uh, her husband might... Uh, Mention the times that he was demoted. demoted. Yeah. Well, a few times it was. They make advantage of me. Take advantage of me. <laughs> but the funny part is, even though I was a private, I always did the sergeant's job. Like one colonel said, he's. I'm going to break you. You're down, but you're not out. <laughs> Was, was there a tradition of military service in your family? No. No. No, in fact, I was the first one to go in. Did you have brothers or sisters who served? Or well, my brother went in and a nephew went in. Did they all go to the Army? Well, my brother went to the Army. He fought uh, He was on the Burma Road. He wow. Was a combat engineer. And my nephew was in the Air Corps in the South Pacific. It's funny, when, you, when I joined the Army, I was just 18, and they had to get their parents' signature. 
so my dad wasn't going to sign for me. Finally, one of my brothers talked him into it. So he says, you're no son of mine. Don't ever come home. Oh, dear. The first time I went home, he takes me over. This is my son. He's in the cavalry. <laughs> dad, they're like that. <laughs> But he came over from Germany when he was 10 years old. He had no use for the military. I see. So even though they, they demoted you, they needed you, they yeah. they raised you up again. Yeah. But that's the first time anyone has mentioned about the, the importance of the sergeants in building this army to go overseas and effective mobilization. Yeah. So maybe you must have had a good sergeant that trained you, did you? Very good. Yeah. I was trained first in uh, slight service on the cavalry. And then I trained selective service myself. I trained recruits in the Philippines. I trained recruits in the, the cavalry after I was promoted. So on your first, your first tour of duty with the Army. You were, went to the Philippines to train? No, I was the cavalry then. Cavalry then? Then I, 38, I went to, I was in the Philippines from 1938 to 1940. In the Army? Yeah. 52nd Coast Artillery. The Philippines, that must have been warm at times. I didn't notice it. I, I, I think I just acclimated myself to any climate I was in. Yeah, that's a true. That's, I think that's a wonderful talent for a soldier. Because uh, I know in South Dakota, we, on mounted guard a lot, we had bearskin or uh, bearskin coats that we would wear, you know, for everybody. Because mm -hmm. it got pretty cold there. And we still had to ride a horse. So. so when you were out in the in the Philippines in 38, was it? Yeah. Did you sense there was any danger coming out there? Yeah, but I don't think we figured Japan. In fact, we were spending a, a month on the guns, special duty. The Philippines was, I was on a little island in Manila Bay and uh, was 100, I think there's 109 men there. We had enough men to take care of one gun. But we had two 14-inch guns, two 12-inch guns, two 6-inch guns. We had eight 35 millimeter beach positions, machine gun this, and all we could take care of is one gun. So they just let the Army go. It was. Why? Why would they kill you to care one gun? Hmm? Why? Well, it takes that many. You had the, the 14 inch. You had four men loading projectile in there. You had four men on the powder bag. You had your spotters out there. You had them in down the hole getting the gun, next round of ammunition ready. It was, yeah, that's all they wanted. Those guns, were they designed to, to target ships? Yes. Yeah. They were a uh, disappearing carriage. They were a, like a big parapet. The guns below that. When you're ready to fire, they'd push a button and gun would get up. And after you fired, it'd go right back below there. So you couldn't see them when you're. But they, that was made before airplanes. See, they <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> With yeah. the airplanes, they, that, they could still to you. Yeah, American, uh, American air power was. Uh, Important factor. It was. We first went over to where Germans had the air power. But after we got the air superiority, it was a completely different war then, too. So, those guns that you worked on in uh, operated in the Philippines, some island near Manila? or? Well, it was about 30 miles from Manila. Well, Manila and the Manila Bay is like a big horseshoe. Yeah. And across the front were seven miles. And we had Corregidor, Fort Hughes, Fort Drum, and Fort Frank. We had four army bases across the front. 
I was on uh, Fort Hughes, and in the last six months I was over there, I was on Purgador. So, when the Japanese invaded, I wonder if those guns were fired. I imagine they were, but uh, like I say, without the air power to protect you, there's no protection. Yeah. So, uh, so after Pearl Harbor then, and all this news comes of the Japanese invasion, you can picture these places that they're rolling into. Yeah. And, yeah. Well, Mr. Horseman, you have a great memory for these uh, items of geography and equipment and officers. Well, Betty's a real hero. She was stationed in Saipan. Wow. So maybe she, Betty will tell us about that in a few yeah. minutes. Well, anyway, Mr. Horseman, at this point, I think we'll, we'll conclude the interview. All right. Thank uh, you. Thank you very much. And Thank you for your service.